Welcome to another segment of City Spotlight. Today, we're gonna to talk to HEARS, which is a group that we started three years ago to help make Long Branch a recovery healthy community. I'll be talking to HEARS Liaison Councilwoman, Dr. Anita Vogt, as well as HEARS Steering Committee Chair, Susan Marco. So let's get started. Susan or Anita, tell me, what does HEARS stand for? What is the mission? And what have you been up to for the last two years and what do you have planned? Um, HEARS actually stands for Health, Education, Addiction, and Recovery Support. And, uh, you know, it's been an interesting year with, for everyone, obviously with the pandemic, but um, for us, we wanted to keep the momentum going, even though a lot of what we had planned, we, we weren't able to necessarily like be together to do these things. But even in even inside of that, we've been able to continue with our community connection breakfasts, which bring people together from, uh, you know, organizations in the field of addiction treatment, as well as residents to come together and network. And, you know, although virtual, you don't get a free breakfast, still we were able to meet and tackle certain topics uh, related to substance use disorder. We've also continued with our video project program and our partnerships, which I, I'm gonna hold off on saying too much about because I think Anita can really cover that topic very well about the connections and um, you know, partnerships that we have that enable us to be able to provide more resources for people who really need it. So how can we reach out and find out more about HEARS? What is the, what's the website address? Let's start with that. The website address is um, www.longbranchhears.com. And if somebody wants to reach out, you know, if they want, you know, quicker response, they can just email us at info at longbranchhears.com. Anita, I've often said that this group, um, you know, really has been growing and growing. What, what motivates you, Anita? I know you started this about three years ago at this point. What keeps you going? What what motivates you? Thank, thank you, Mayor. And um, actually, thank you for the compliment of saying that. I started this three years ago. Um, really, you and I started it three years ago, and we built on so much of the work um, that people like Susan and so many really service providers in the field had already been, been doing. Um, we were initially, and, and for the mayor and myself, and I, I think Susan, this applies to you also, uh, we were initially motivated um, because of a city resident who, uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, on the campaign trail, just told us the, I'm gonna use the word horrifying experiences that she had um, in trying to get services for her son um, who has been an addict for, for, for quite a while. And it was at a time, you remember this mayor, that, that you and I were thinking about the, you know, the upcoming election, thinking about the activities that we were gonna focus on. And it just became very clear to us in that moment that this needed to be a priority for us to, uh, to address. Um, we had an interesting, both Susan and I were in an interesting conversation just, just the other day, as a matter of fact, for, for an interview. And uh, it was the question of, you know, why do you do what you do? And um, it was a very simple answer. If you can help, you do help. And, you know, I think that that has been a motivating factor for peers and, and really all the people in this type of, of service. So what continues to motivate us? Um, I think when we look back at the progress that we've made, the support that we have, the extraordinary need to continue, and the idea that really, you know, bottom line, what we wanna do is we wanna save lives and that's happening. And, you know, that, that's what keeps us going. Susan, if I may, a lot of what you talk about is ending the stigma. Can you explain that? And why is that so important? To me, in my experience, and, you know, we had a family member who struggled for many years 
fortunately he has found sobriety. He's three and a half years sober now. So I mean, we're grateful for that. But you know, um, when you're faced with this in your family, all kinds of things come up. And the biggest issue that I can see is that stigma that still exists in that substance use disorder is actually listed in the DSM, which is you know the diagnostic um, journal that doctors use. It has been classified as a disease for many years, but still people treat it as a moral failing or a choice. Now look at somebody may choose to take a drug. Somebody may, um, you know, as a young person may choose to dabble in and try something because they want to get high or whatever, and then they fall down the rabbit hole into this scenario of addiction. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to be an addict. People, for one reason or another, whether it's through, um, you know, a prescription medication that then ends up bringing them down a, a path or, you know, whatever, however they get there. Once they're in that, it's a disease of the brain. And until people actually recognize that, and I'm grateful to say there's a lot more recognition now than 10 years ago. Things have definitely come a long way and changed, but there's still a lot of work to do in terms of educating the public about what substance use disorder actually is and why it's important not to stigmatize people for it because the shame and guilt of somebody who finds themselves in that scenario will keep pushing them further down that rabbit hole of addiction rather than helping them climb out of it. Thank you, Susan. So Anita, what, can, what has the group HEARS done to end the stigma and what more needs to be done and what more can we do? Let me build on what uh, what Susan uh, just said in terms of stigma. And, and again, uh, Susan and, and, and Mayor, you may recall our, our um, kickoff event. Uh, we had the sign that we had everybody there that night and it was like about 100 people actually signed uh, a, a big banner that we had, Stop the, the Stigma Banner. But I'm going to move that to a different level, Mayor, when you ask what have, um, what have we done and what's, uh, you know, what is left to do. So in terms of Long Branch, you know, uh, certainly here's had, uh, had our banner. Long Branch has joined many of the municipalities who have signed resolutions to uh, stop the stigma. And um, the county has, um, it has this wonderful Stop the Stigma campaign uh, going on led by Pam Major, who's doing just uh, an amazing job with leading that whole effort. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question because after the banner, after the resolution, after those things, how do you really stop the stigma? How do you change the way people think? And again, just like Susan said, how, helping people come to realize that um, addiction is a disease and needs to be treated in that way. So, uh, so one of the common ways of, a common phrase in this whole scenario is, you know, we are very comfortable accepting physical ailments. We, you expect people in the, you know, in the course of a lifetime, you're, you're physically gonna get some sort, of a, some sort of an ailment. And that's considered the norm. But we don't deal with addiction and we don't deal with mental health in that way. We're not accepting of that. And that's how that stigma just keeps on, on growing and growing. So um, for me and for, for here's and, and certainly again, Mayor, um, I'm, I'm really proud of what Long Branch is doing um, because we're very active with the county um, effort. And uh, one of the things that we're trying, our, our, our next project that we're gonna be working on is really outreach to the business community. And um, we are getting a group together that is being spearheaded by the county 
Uh, we want to look to, um, you know, include the chambers, any sort of business organization with the idea of education. You know, how, how do we start to educate people to better understand the, the mechanism, how addiction works? And with that, then, how can we take it a few steps further and help them for themselves, for their employees, for their customers, um, you know, stop that stigma of being afraid. So there are there are a lot of efforts like that. I mean, there there are there are um, so many projects. It's constant. It's constant, and it's one of the most important aspects of this that we can do um, because the stigma is just so detrimental. I must tell you, you have a really nice website, Susan. Tell me a little bit about it. We one of the things when we set out to create the website that we wanted very much to be able to do was to create a resource directory rich with that, obviously resources for people who need them in the local community. And so uh, we put together a committee and we started to make phone calls. We called every, per, every um, listing on that resource directory. One of us has spoken to directly about, you know, to make sure that they are who they say they are and doing what they say they're doing. And that is continual. You know, we will always be following up and continuing to uh, verify, you know, the, the validity of the things on that resource directory. Um, so, you know, website is great. People can go there and they can find all kinds of content and information about what's available to them. But really that resource directory, to me, that's the key component of our website. So hopefully we're on the road to uh back to normalcy, I guess my question for you, Anita, is what, uh, so what do you see in the coming years and, and what do you see a year from now for HEARS? What, what's your plans for the future with this organization and group? HEARS is all about saving lives uh, and it's all about moving the needle, so to speak. Um, Long Branch, unfortunately, is among the top five municipalities in the county. Um, in terms of what we deal with, uh, with the extent of the opioid um, uh, epidemic in, in, in Long Branch. If we, for here's to be able to lower the number, save more lives, um, bring more resources to Long Branch so that we can deal with it more effectively, um, that's, that's what we wanna see uh, every year, every year going forward. And the way we're gonna do that is with uh, reaching out, creating more partnerships, more advocacy, more programs to inform people, more education. So um, when we think, you know, where do we wanna be next year? Um, we actually went through a strategic planning process and, and uh, spent many hours, right? Susan spent many hours uh, thinking through uh, what are the priorities for HEARS and, and how are we going to achieve it. So we have a pretty good roadmap of the um, activities that, that we want to do. And fortunately, even in the early days of putting HEARS together, I think we hit on uh, the right combination of uh, activities. Our focus was on increasing awareness, sponsoring programs and services, advocacy, and a real boots on the ground service to directly helping people um, in their moment of need. And those four priorities for us, I think have been um, the keys to making um, HEARS effective in these past two and a half years and maintaining that focus. Um, again, I think it's the right scope of, uh, of, of work for, for heroes to, to take on with that one intent of saving, saving more lives. As we wrap up, I'd like to ask both of you, um, any last comments or so forth? You know, we've talked about a lot of things today. Um, 
what about prevention? What about, what is the message from here's for children? Children who might have a family member who suffers from addiction or an older brother or a sister or a friend. Um, what do we say to them? What does here's do to reach out uh, to kids? One of our partnering organizations is the um, Robert Wood Johnson Institute for Prevention and Recovery. And actually two of the people that work on the prevention end of that are on our steering committee. So the program, what they've instituted in Long Branch is something called Communities That Care or CTC, which is a 10 year commitment to the city. And what they do is they break it down. The first year they spent gathering data and statistics about where the gaps are uh, where are our children falling through those gaps? And then the second part of it, I believe, is in developing programs specifically geared toward what the gaps are in our local community. So I think we're in year two of communities that care now. So there's, they're, they're, they're with us for eight more years. And I got to give a shout out to um, Kendall Murphy, who is running that. And Andrea Zapsek, who's also on that part of the, of the, of, you know, the prevention end of things. They're doing amazing things and we're so, so lucky and grateful to have them. You know, what about those who are actually in, you know, suffering from, currently suffering from addiction and want some help? Maybe they hesitate to go to a mom and dad. They hesitate to go to the police department or to to ask anybody for that help. It's sort of hidden. They're, uh, they can't get out of it, but they they want to do something about it. Um, what advice do you have for them? I'm not sure. You know, I want to just another I'm going to call out another group who's doing the most amazing, you know, boots on the ground kind of work is also through the IFPR at RWJ Barnabas. Our, um, uh, Lynn Seward is, has created this grant funded program called the Innovations Project and two women who are in recovery themselves actually go out in their own vehicle. They go out in their car, they go to the places where active substance abuse, substance use. I mean, sometimes this language, you know, people who are suffering, who are active in active addiction, hang out in certain areas, right? So they will go to those people and meet them where they are and just start a random conversation and say, hey, you know what? I've been where you are and I know what, I know what's going on here. How can I help? What do you need? You need a meal? Do you need a bed? Do you need you want to talk to somebody and they'll connect them with. So we need more programs like that. And, you know, like the, the mobile van and the VNA has a mobile outreach. Also, they go out and they just talk to people and they provide information and, you know, do harm reduction t services, you know, uh, teaching people how to use uh, overdose prevention uh, techniques. Um, Listen, again, we have a long way to go, but all these kind of programs we need more of. And I just, I wanna also add to that and adding to what Anita said of, for me, I think one of the things that is unique about Long Branch years is that it wasn't a group of people who came together and said, oh, you know, mayor and council, can you, would you support this? This came out of a need and a desire that you, a need that you saw and a desire to be also part of the solution of that, you too mayor and and councilwoman vote you know thank you so much is all i can say because you, this is really sets us it sets us apart and puts us on a really good trajectory to really make much more of a difference so and if i could thank you susan if, if i could add to what susan said and mayor i'm going to take you back to that day that um you and i knocked on the door uh, of our, our, I'm going to say beloved city resident who um, told the story that Susan just, um, just talked about. Where do I go for resources? I've gone everywhere and I can't find um, the, the right place. Um, 
And the um, and this person was on our steering committee um, in the beginning, and she played a very special role because she kept holding our feet to the fire. And she said, the programs are wonderful, the advocacy is wonderful, but what are you doing directly? When, and we would call it the boots on the ground. What are you doing in terms of boots on the ground? And it was because of the connections that we had made and the partnerships that we had made that we were able to work with Lynn and work with the county on developing this innovation program that did, does exactly what Susan said. They, they get a call at two o'clock in the morning, someone down at the train station, you know, needs help and they're there, you know? So um, it, this, this whole process takes on a life of its own and it continues to evolve um, almost uh, episode after episode, you know, as the needs um, reveal themselves, peers, uh, you know, adjusts and tries to uh, tries to, to serve serve that need. But that idea, Mayor, of who do I turn to, um, was a real driving force for years in the beginning, and still is, and still is. Well, I just want to say, Susan Marco and Dr. Boat, thank you for tears. Thank you for all the wonderful things you do with this group, for all of your group, for all that you do for, for Long Branch. It's, it's uh, so, so appreciated and so needed. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening. And uh, we'll be back shortly with a, another segment of City Spotlight. Thank you. <laughs>